Yesterday, just like any school day, I arrived at 8 a.m., waved at the campus monitor as I swiped my badge to unlock the front door, and headed down the hall to my classroom. It was unremarkable from any other school day, except for the total absence of students. During silent reading time, I realized that it was actually silent. I could hear the hands on the clock moving. I could hear the hard drive of my laptop spinning. I could hear a low-level hum that the building makes that I had never noticed before. On a normal day, silent reading time isn't ever technically silent. Usually I can hear students turning pages, shifting in their chairs, scrawling notes as they read. Someone's phone buzzes or there's a brief whispered conversation between a couple of students. And I can hear the movement of life and life beyond my classroom too. Students passing by in the hall, the discussion happening in the classroom next door, the noises of a building filled with 2,300 humans. But now, silent reading time is actually silent because my students aren't in the room with me. This is what my classroom looks like now. I teach from that podium into the tiny webcam that sits on a tripod behind the large monitor. Staring directly into the lens is the closest my students and I can get to eye contact. When they work in small groups, their faces move from my huge monitor to the smaller laptop screens placed on the tables where my students should be sitting. As they arrive in their breakout groups and start talking to each other, at least it sounds like a classroom full of high school students, but it doesn't look like one. Nothing about teaching feels familiar right now. I can hear my colleagues' voices through the walls as they teach alone into the cameras in their classrooms, but the absence of student noise is deafening. During our short breaks between classes, we meet, and we meet each other in the empty hall for some quick conversation behind our masks. There are social distancing signs and floor decals all over the school, ready for the possible return of students to hybrid instruction at some point. Possibly the weirdest thing is the waxed floors. They still look first day of school shiny a couple of months later. This is my 25th year as an educator, but I feel like it's my first year again. Each 90 minute class period must be a tightly orchestrated production with no room for the kind of mostly planned improvisation I typically rely on. I'm unmoored without the physical presence of my students. I can't watch them carefully for their reactions, their tells for whether they're engaged or not, the sounds they utter, the looks they throw at each other across the room. We're all together on a computer screen, but that is no substitute for the energy that we build when we're in the sacred space of the classroom together. I've lost my teacher superpower. In this unfamiliar landscape, the work that matters most is still the work that matters most. That means designing every virtual inch of my classroom space to be a humanizing place where every student feels valued and safe and accepted for exactly who they are. I've been using grading practices to humanize my classroom. As Maya Wilson explains in her book, the presence of any scale for grading, percentage-based, A through F, or standards-based, results in a hierarchy where some students are more than and some are less. This only perpetuates their social structures that continue to do the same. The traditional grading system demands that we rank and sort and measure our students. So how do we work to disrupt this? Well, I refuse to rank and sort my students. I individualize instruction and assessment. I ask them to track their own learning and growth. I encourage my students to be something other than point collectors. Instead, I want my students to be people who read and write and think to be better humans. My students get feedback on individual assignments rather than points, grades, or rubric scores. The feedback comes from me sometimes, but often it comes from their peers. I use the gradebook only to keep track of whether or not students are doing the assignments and to collect qualitative descriptive notes about their work. Just because I'm expected to use a percentage-based gradebook to math my way to final grades doesn't mean that I have to. My students set goals, they make a plan for the growth they want to achieve, they track their progress and select their final grades at semester's end when they write to me about what they've learned. I do this goal setting too. Just a few weeks ago, I shared my reading practice goal with my students to read as many own voices texts as I can to widen my understanding of the human experience and to grow my empathy. And I've seen that same focus reflected in the reading goals many of my students have crafted for themselves. Even though we're distanced, we're using our classroom space to do this important equity work together. 
On the afternoon of our last day of schools we might call normal back in March, the new faculty book club met to launch our study of Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. The book study was an idea put forward by a colleague on the heels of some racist student language in a couple of separate incidents, and nearly 50 of my colleagues signed on. We distributed the books our principal bought for us and laid out our plans for the subsequent book club meetings. Not only did we successfully meet online to discuss uh, Kendi's book in the weeks ahead, we even managed summer work together on Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility. We asked ourselves, what does it mean to do equity work to humanize education if you're a white teacher from a relatively privileged background teaching at a school with relatively privileged students in a mostly white progressive college town? I had been wrestling with these questions personally and now I was in the company of dozens of my colleagues wrestling with them too. In June, we came across Trey Johnson's article in the Washington Post, when black people are in pain, white people join book clubs. It was an important reminder that we had to move our work to action. My school has since established a working group to examine our systems, policies, and procedures through an anti-racist lens. I've heard more than one of my colleagues of color from across the country say in a conference presentation or a tweet or in a conversation that white liberals are the most difficult educators to move towards equity work. Why? Well, because we think we have it all figured out, that we would never do anything racist or classist or sexist or homophobic, and that we are in no way a part of the problem. Cornelius Minor said in his keynote address at the Conference on English Leadership a few years ago that we're complicit in perpetuating these issues if we're not working actively against them. He explained that systems that oppress are like machines that keep running unless we actively turn them off, and he outlined all the places oppressive systems hide in schools. I hope my recent book, Pointless, An English Teacher's Guide to More Meaningful Grading, helps teachers imagine practical strategies to disrupt the oppression wrapped up in our traditional grading systems. Nothing is more important in education right now than building systems that humanize and liberate. This pandemic has, a, has interrupted some of the systems where oppression hides in schools. I wouldn't say it's turned them off. We have to do that ourselves. But the abrupt pivot to online instruction exposed gaping holes in a system that we cannot ignore. Schools across the country have scrambled to fill these holes over the last several months. For my district, that has meant providing students access to devices and reliable Wi-Fi for online instruction. It has meant supporting families with food, no questions asked. It has meant accounting for what affects students' abilities to focus on being in school while being at home. It has meant getting teachers up to speed with the new tools and strategies that we need to teach online. It has meant tracking down our students who aren't showing up in our video classes to figure out how we can help. It has meant re-seeing the rituals and routines we have taken for granted. What should freshman orientation look like? Back to school night? Parent-teacher conferences? Graduation? Our daily bell schedule? Grading? Is it possible that we'll come up with new ways to do these things that are better than how we have done them before? Since I entered the doctoral program at the CU Boulder School of Education in 2004, I've lived somewhere between theory and practice. In fact, between theory and practice was the main title of my doctoral dissertation. The theory I relied on and built in that study has informed my teaching ever since. It is theory I've actually taken into practice. My theoretical underpinning for equity work in education is strong. I've read the seminal texts, discussed them with my professors and my cohort in graduate school, and integrated them into my writing and research. But it has been within the landscape of practice where I have actually been able to begin to understand what equity work means. This has been a slow awakening, arriving over a period of years, largely due to listening carefully to my colleagues, those who have been marginalized by the system, when they speak and write about what an education that truly liberates looks like. Pandemic or no, I continue to listen and learn about what it means to build that liberating education for my students, about how to turn off systems that oppress in all the nooks and crannies where they show up in my classroom and school. What will we remember about this time? Will we think about the innovations we discovered as we navigated the challenges we never expected we'd have to, coming out on the other side a kinder, more flexible, more humanizing and liberating version of schooling? Or will it be that weird blip back in 2020 where nothing about schooling ever actually changed? I'd like to linger on those questions, but I have to get ready to teach tomorrow. Thank you.